In that last video, hypocritical me, uh, example number two, my wife asked me if, when I brought up A Color Purple, if I was thrown by the movie because it was so far back in the past and maybe they were dealing with things that I, I wouldn't associate with today. And if Baby Boy made more sense to me because it was more current and I was more familiar with, with that type of behavior. I respectfully disagree. I'm, I'm a student of history and I also have an understanding of of how domestic relationships for all societies, all colors, going back in time were far more aggressive, right? They, they weren't as mature as they are now. My feeling is that the reason why A Color Purple threw me after I read the book and then years later I saw the movie and I loved the book but not the movie as much was because Sometimes the people who are charged with putting something together can be a little tone deaf and don't necessarily understand what needs to be left in. And by left in, Alice Walker is an incredible writer, a master writer. She ain't putting no fat in the book. If Alice Walker wrote it, it was meant to be there. So if your job is to take things out in order to make it short enough uh, to be in movie format, that's a difficult job when, when you're talking about taking away from what Alice Walker put down. That's a tall order. They took out some of the wrong stuff. There was some context she had in there, some things that provided framework, things that made us understand a little bit more of the what was going on behind some of these actions. They, they took the things out. They didn't think they were important. A good example is the movie Ragtime, written by a man named E.L. Doctorow, who as it turns out, he's one of my favorite writers. He's somebody who worked with James Baldwin. He was either his manager or worked for the publisher, but, but they were friends nonetheless. E.L. Doctorow, uh, his movie, the movie that came out based on the book Ragtime, was dead on. So there were whole storylines in that book that didn't appear in the movie, but what they showed, they, they did it justice. Ragtime, if you get a chance to check it out, you feel like this is a demonstration of how a black man felt about his black woman back in the past, right? This is how black love was. They were committed to each other. And it's it's really on point. That's what was missing from Color Purple. They, they took out the wrong parts. They were tone deaf. They didn't know what they needed to leave in uh, that resonated with black men and women, or they didn't care. To veer off the subject for a second, Howard Rollins, who starred in that movie, he was the man back in the 80s in terms of a black male actor. In the 60s, you had Sidney Poitier, got an Academy Award for um, Lilies in the Field, got all types of different accolades killed the 60s. In the 70s, you had someone who used to be mentored by Sidney Poitier, which was Billy D. Williams, and you know he did his thing. He had to deal with Barry Gordy in addition to the other movies he made, and they made uh, Lady Sings the Blues, Mahogany. And then if you skip the 80s for a second, you had Wesley Snipes, who was killing it throughout the 90s, and also killing it in the 90s was Denzel. And oddly enough, it seems like since then, uh, nobody in terms of a black male actor has come close to, to Denzel, right? But let's go back to the 80s. In the 80s, you had Howard Rollins, who was also nominated for major awards, for an Academy Award, for a Golden Globe, for an Emmy, came out of a theater in North Avenue in, in Baltimore. And if you know anything about Baltimore, that's right there in the hood, you know, by... by um, not far from Pennsylvania Avenue, went to Towson University, went up to New York and started acting in soap operas, got to Hollywood, and everything was going well for Howard Rollins until it didn't. We looked up to him because he was well-spoken, always articulate, always well-dressed, always classy, determined, handsome. Next thing you know, you know, when he's being spit out the bottom of the Hollywood uh, machine, he's like, Tongue kissing some white cat. He's got on a fur, ratty fur coat, drugged up and looking crazy, you know? And, and not to speak about what his choices were and what was wrong with that image, but that image was completely different than the image we came up looking up to. But back to the previous subject, tone deaf is crazy. When you have people who are regulating black art and they're not of the culture. I saw an interview recently where a rapper was in and out of jail, shot people, so on and so forth, but when he put out his album, he didn't want to rap about killing people. He didn't want to rap about what he did in life. He wanted to rap about upliftment. He wanted to rap about hope and still do it lyrically. When he turned in his stuff, the A&R people at the label, they, they refused it. 
They called it garbage. It was too artistic. But when he was rapping about killing black people, disparaging sisters, then that was called commercial. They refused his work. There are think tanks, these government actors, these organizations, political action committees that have as their agenda the suppression of black energy. They've got resources that go way beyond what some rapper street team could have in terms of bringing somebody to number one and making sure that they are popular in record sales. Recently, I saw an interview of Oliver Stone, and he mentioned that when you do a spy film or a military film, if it's on narrative, for the, the, the agencies, this on narrative for the military, for the Pentagon, they will often lend you resources. Green light things, a lot of things will go your way if you're speaking on message, on topic for, for what they're trying to get out there. The same thing would be true for think tanks, for organizations, for government actors when it comes to rappers. If you're already promoting a message that they want promoted, why wouldn't they get behind you? Why wouldn't they push it? And you're talking about major resources, not street team resources. They've got assets that are larger than the record industry itself. To put in perspective the type of money that major organizations have at their disposal, just take, for example, Apple. And this is not nothing to do with racism or promoting rappers or whatever, but Apple, September 3rd, lost $180 billion with a B dollars in market cap. Their stock dropped 8%. 180 billion is more money than the record industry would make in 10 years. 180 billion in a day. So put it in perspective, think about the type of money. So when we talk about you speaking a message that meets the agenda of some of these organizations, when they come to, to help you, we're not talking about street team money, right? We're not talking about label money. The entire industry don't have the type of money that they could push you with. If you're pushing the agenda that they want pushed, Things could go your way, and you have no idea why that why that's happening. What bothers me is not necessarily what rappers don't know. It is what my brothers, whom I love, claim not to know. We all know words have power. I'm a spoken word artist, and everything I have has come from my ability to use words. Words manifest everything else. And you've got to know that because if it wasn't for words, you'd be wherever you were or wherever you were headed before fame and fortune. When a brother sits down for an interview or someone asks him about the words that he used, just just stand up for what, you, what you're doing. You know words have power. For someone to say that words don't matter, what matters is what the politicians are doing and what matters is what's going on in society and what the people are doing. Now words are that germ, words are the seed that manifests everything. So to pretend like you don't understand that everything you have came from your ability to use words that manifest certain things into society, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to your listeners. Words are that seed. They help manifest them to everything.